welcome to the DC Today. You uh, have no idea how quickly I have arrived from the airport. I flew very early out of Grand Rapids, Michigan this morning through Denver, came back to Newport Beach right as the market was closing, and now I'm sitting in the studio of our Newport office recording today's DC Today. It was an interesting day in the markets. Of course, because my day starts so early and I was on East Coast, I was really early into the futures. And I would have bet um, that you were going to have a real significant sell-off today as the futures were piling on the late day sell-off from yesterday. And um, it ended up being a very bizarre day. Not only um, what did the Dow open down a couple hundred points and then worsened, but then it came all the way back up and actually went positive. Um, and then in the final 15 minutes or so, we're back to this charade again. Um, it dropped off, but the Dow closed down only 146 points. Now, the S&P was down over 1%, a little bit over 1%, and the um, NASDAQ was down one73 You combine that to what the NASDAQ sell-off was yesterday. Now you're starting to talk about a real sell-off, but very little very benign, um, especially over a three, four, five day period in the Dow, in value, in old line companies and blue chips. But uh, yeah, this is a pretty significant drawdown now um, in the last few days on the on the tech side. Tech was the worst performing sector today. It was down 3%. Communication services, its sister cousin sector was down 2.8. So basically both of the sort of techie sectors were down 3%. Energy was the best performing sector. It was up over 2%. And it was a bit more mixed of a day than some of the market averages indicate. I know on my screen, just a tiny bit less than half of our stocks were up today and a little more than half were down. So that's generally indi- indication of, you know, kind of a mixed bag across sectors and certain names. Um, and the energy stuff, you know, hel- helped as well. The 10-year treasury was um, <clears throat> up nine basis points. It's yield. Uh, to 415. And so I'm trying to think where it started yesterday. That's a meaningful move, not not like last time, and it hasn't come up and retested the prior highs. It may do so, but it hasn't yet. Um, but again, you're still dealing with quite an inversion in the curve between the short end and the long end. Yesterday's sell-off, by the way, the um, the breadth, which is sort of the the amount of um, advancers to decliners or vice versa, to give you an indication of kind of, again, the word breadth uh, uh, across what level of market participation and either an up move or down move. And you did have an eight to one uh, decliner to advancer ratio yesterday. And so we've had plenty of those this year, but I mean, that, that was pretty solid breadth. I've seen much worse this year, but it wasn't it wasn't anything good. But the thing I want to point out is Apple, um, as a big tech company, is one of the few that had rallied after its earnings this season, uh, where you know Facebook, Google, Microsoft got hammered, uh, Amazon got hammered. Apple had rallied, and then with the Fed's announcement. Um, yesterday's sell-off, and now today was down another, I think, 3 or 4%. Apple gave all of that rally back and then some in just minutes. Yesterday, it was about 20 minutes to get rid of about five days of return. And so I don't bring that up with any indication or any thought or any comment about an outlook for those particular companies. I bring it up to say that the market is punishing the top of the cap stack, the larger capitalizations are getting hit, the larger PEs and particularly those sectors. And that's kind of inside our vein of a long duration stock situation that are most vulnerable and shorter duration stocks um, that are that are much more defensive in this environment. Um, an interesting tidbit I'll share, the last time the Fed funds rate was at 4% and the Fed was still in the tightening mode, the S&P multiple, this is back to 2005, by the way, the S&P's multiple is about 15 times earnings. It's currently getting down near, you know, 16 times. But it's so fascinating because this is all pre-GFC stuff. Financials were the largest sector. Uh, keep in mind, 2005 was only five years after the tech blow up and tech had not come back yet. And people forget that because it had such a monstrous decade, last decade. 
But it wasn't like the NASDAQ imploded in 2000 and two years later, tech was back or three years later. In 2005, uh, financials were the leading, were the largest sector within the index, but by largest, they made up about 20% of the S&P. Now tech is the largest and that's with them carving out communication services, which used to be considered part of tech, by the way. And uh, tech right now is 26% of the market. And it, uh, at the beginning of the year was over 30. And so that's a byproduct of other sectors coming up so much and tech coming down so much. Um, but I'll, another factor I'll share, and this could be a bullish indicator if you think historical comparisons matter. I don't think they do, but I share it for a reference point. Investment grade spreads were 100. They're 150 now, meaning investment grade corporate bonds averaged 100 basis points wide. Um, so they were much um, richer. And now they're 150 wide, meaning they're much cheaper. High yield was at 350. Um, and so 3.5% higher uh, yield for, for junk bonds than treasury bonds in 2005. Now it's up to 450. So you don't have recession-like spreads in high yield, but you're, you're a lot richer than you were in 05, excuse me, cheaper than you were in 05. And, and the market multiple is not all that far apart. So interesting, it is still a little bit more expensive though, but I just wanted to provide some historical comparison. In the news, I don't know much to say. Bibi Netanyahu is back in Israel. I don't, I, I think he's now done like 32 terms or something. I don't know, uh, but it's, it's a pretty amazing political story. And so our congratulations to Netanyahu and uh, his campaign. Okay, uh, Fed stuff. The Bank of England raised 75 basis points today, as our Fed did in America yesterday. We were expecting that. One noteworthy thing, it's a little tiny bit different, but they said they actually called out financial market expectations and said financial markets are anticipating a rate potentially higher than what we might do if conditions call for us to tighten at a slower pace. So they basically said something similar to what Powell said yesterday, like, look, if conditions warrant, we may slow down how quickly we're tightening. But then the Bank of England added, and the financial markets might be overestimating how, how tight we're going to be. And I, I haven't seen that from a central bank. And so uh, we'll, we'll see if that's somewhat um, indicating of uh, other rhetoric that may be forthcoming from other central banks. I will point out most of this, by the way, uh, you're still thousands of points higher than you were a few weeks ago, but most of what's happened in the last day or two, uh, particularly long duration stocks, is that the terminal rate of Fed funds across the term structure, so not just in January, not just in June, but across the entire maturity spectrum um, rate went up about 20 basis points. So the market had whatever they were expecting in Fed funds. I won't get into all that detail month by month over about, I think I looked out about nine months. Uh, all nine months, it was raised proportionately about 20 basis points. So that's kind of the story here. Um, economically, 1.485 million continuing job claims. So that's up 47,000. The weekly initial jobless claims were uh, 217, 218. They were right, I think, within a thousand of expectation. It's higher, you know, than it had gone a few weeks ago, but it's it's nothing to write home about. But um, this is the most since March that the continuing jobless claims have hit. And I've said it before, we have to allow a few weeks of a cycle to see, particularly with continuing, because they only report every other week, the weekly or weekly. So I want to get more of a, a run rate before I, I interpret that data. ISM services uh, came in at 54.4, so it's still plenty expansionary, but it was expected to be 55.4. So it was a full point lower than expected. But what stuck out to me was that new orders dropped four points. So it continues to be uh, certain indications of economic uh, slowness, other indications of economic strength or resilience. Uh, I've said it a million times. I can't stop saying it because the data points keep indicating it. There's a lot of back and forth interpretation in, in various and uh, differing economic data points. The BLS jobs data will come out at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow, Friday. 
and expect to hear a lot of really, really dumb things said about that. Um, I'm looking forward to the Dividend Cafe tomorrow. It's going to be all about dividends and a particular angle on dividend investing I want you to consider. And um, what else? Monday will be our normal long form DC Today. Uh, Tuesday, we'll do our regular video podcast like we're doing right now with a, a commentary um, and synopsis of the market. But then Wednesday, I will be doing in the morning a written commentary on the midterm elections from the night before. But then after the market, Wednesday, Thursday, there won't be a DC Today. We have all 50 of the employees of the Bonson Group on planes headed to our Nashville office where we will be for our offsite team retreat at a undisclosed location in downtown Nashville uh, for, for uh, th starting Wednesday night through um, the weekend, into the weekend. So there will be a Dividend Cafe Friday. There will not be a DC Today next Thursday. There will not be a DC Today next Wednesday, but there will be a midterm election commentary that will write when, and get out Wednesday morning. And I just wanted to prep you for those things for next week. That's all I got. Reach out with any questions, questions at thebonsongroup.com. And thank you for listening to this Thursday edition of the DC Today.